Okay, all right. Um, well, this uh, event is brought to you by the Year of Wellness here at Moorpark College, as well as uh, NAMI on Campus. We've uh, just recently, a couple of years ago, started a NAMI on Campus club at Moorpark College. Um, there's a sign-in sheet going around. Um, please be sure you put your name, and if you're here for a teacher, put the teacher's name. And then if you're interested in information about the NAMI Club or you might want to join, um, please uh, go ahead and add uh, your email. So that email part's optional if you'd like uh, more information about the NAMI Club. Um, some of you may already know NAMI stands for National Alliance on Mental Illness. Uh, and so um, what we do is uh, have different events to raise awareness on mental illness and related issues and to decrease uh, stigma associated with that. So my name is Diane Scrofano. I teach English and I'm co-advisor of NAMI on campus with Sharon Manicus, who you may know um, as director of our Student Health Center, which has wonderful behavioral and mental health um, services as well as your, for your physical health. Um, so, uh, we've got some um, volunteer speakers here today to do in our own voices, so people uh, living their journey um, with a mental illness diagnosis. Um, we've also got um, a few words from the executive director of uh, NAMI Ventura County, and this is, uh, this is David. Oh, you're gonna, okay, all right, so you're not gonna talk, okay. All right, so our volunteers uh, are Karen and Regina, and I think if there's no further ado, we'll go ahead and let them do their thing. Okay. Okay, oh, we got it, all right, thanks. So good afternoon, my name is Regina Pointer, and this is my first day at college. <laughs> um, so great to see uh, so many of you. Um, I am a NAMI volunteer and member and have been for about nine years. Um, as um, she shared, NAMI stands for the National Alliance on Mental Illness. And it started back in 1979, so about 36 years ago, by two moms who had children that were suffering from severe mental illness. And they realized that there must be other family members like them that wanted to uh, raise um, awareness about mental illness. They wanted to educate families about mental illness. And they wanted to provide resources as well as trainings. And so with that um, was born NAMI. And um, today there are NAMI affiliates all over the United States. Here in California, uh, we have a state level uh, NAMI office. Uh, we have a NAMI office in Washington. So we, NAMI does a lot of things in the political arena um, to help pass bills that would be um, beneficial to individuals that have mental health challenges. Um, we have here in Ventura County, our affiliate is very strong. Our office is out of uh, Camarillo, and they provide many various programs for family members, as well as consumers and various support groups. And if you have any questions about what they offer, I'm sure that your NAMI club can provide that to you, but you can always call the office in Camarillo and someone will, will get back to you. Um, at this time, I am very honored to introduce our new executive director and a longtime friend and colleague of mine, um, David Deutsch. For those of you who haven't met Karen before, you always know where she's sitting when she's at an event. Um, my name's David Deutsch. I'm, uh, as Regina said, I'm the new executive director for NAMI Ventura County. I've been on the board of directors for three years. I've been involved with NAMI for about eight or nine years. I've worked in the field of mental health treatment and substance use disorder treatment for about 12 years. I'm a licensed clinical social worker and I'm a certified addiction treatment counselor. And although I don't have lived experience of mental health challenges, I do have lived experience with substance use disorder. I'm a recovering heroin and cocaine addict. I've been in recovery for about 15 and a half years. Um, so 
I decided about 15 years ago that I was going to dedicate the rest of my life to helping people who have substance use disorders. And what I discovered pretty quickly about 12 years ago was that people that have substance use disorders frequently have histories of mental health challenges, histories of incarceration, uh, histories of homelessness. And so I kind of widened my scope of thought to realize I needed to help people with other uh, areas of their life. As Regina said, NAMI is the National Alliance on Mental Illness. We are the largest grassroots organization that advocates for services for people who have mental health challenges in the United States. We have over 1,100 affiliates in the United States. NAMI Ventura County is a very well-respected and well-known affiliate in the state of California, although there are many. And there are not, uh, there's 13 or 14 affiliates just in Los Angeles, so there's not one large NAMI affiliate in Los Angeles, so it's geographically broken up, which allows for communities to do more advocacy that's specifically relevant to their community, and that's what we try to do in our county with being involved with the Behavioral Health Department, with other providers, um, of, uh, or other organizations that are providers of services to people who have mental health challenges um, to um, help shape policy, but really we are known probably primarily for um, what's called family to family, where we help family members who have a, a loved one with a diagnosis understand how they can be supportive and not enabling, understand basics about mental illness. Uh, we also have provider education classes where we provide um, educational materials and resources to people who work in the field or in a related field. And then we have other classes too. We have a peer-to-peer -peer class starting next month, which is directly um, for consumers of, ment of uh, mental health services taught by people with lived experience. What you're going to hear today from Regina and Karen, <coughs> excuse me, is a presentation by two people who have had their own lived experience and who have achieved some really amazing things. And I, um, I've been privileged to know both of them for almost my entire time um, that I've been in the field for the last 12 years. And so um, today is um, special for me to be able to hear. I know both of their stories, although I'm sure I'll hear stuff that I didn't know. Um, we always do that. So I'm really pl uh, really pleased to have them here. I think it's really important. I think what one of the things you can take away from any kind of presentation like this is that we really don't know everything about somebody based on our first perception of them or our first impression of them. We live in a world where we tend to size people up in about 20 seconds or 30 seconds, and we decide who they are in that 20 or 30 seconds. And real, the reality of the situation is we really don't know that person based on that, but it's a, it's a human nature, at least in our world today, to do that. I think at this point in my life, as a 62-year-old um, middle-aged white male in a suit and tie, I think most people would probably think that I've, uh, see me, would probably just think that I've uh, been in the field for many years, a uh, professional person and all that. I have been for the last 12 years. Um, I've been clean for 15 years. That three years in between the 12 years I've worked in the field and the 15 years ago that I got clean and sober was a time when I spent three years in San Quentin State Prison for transportation of marijuana and cocaine. So I have the lived experience of, uh, of serving time in state prison as well. So it's important, to re uh, it's important to realize that people come from a lot of different backgrounds and have walked a lot of different walks in their life. Um, we can never let people be limited by what has happened to them in their past. It's really important to be open to the idea that there's a future for everybody, no matter what they've um, what they've had to go through. So, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Regina. So, a um, little bit about me. I am 56 years old. I've been married for 38 years. I have three beautiful daughters and an amazing 13-year-old grandson. I've lived in Ventura County for about 42 years. And I grew up in Oxnard, graduated from Oxnard High School. Yay, Yellow Jackets. Um, and um, I came to know NAMI through my own mental health challenges. And um, one of the things that I enjoy doing is um, my husband is a movie buff, so we enjoy going to movies and going out to dinner together. I love paddle boarding. I um, have lived, visited Kauai, and that's where I learned how to paddle board, and I love the ocean. And 
Um, what else? Um, I am a peer support specialist. I work with individuals that have mental health challenges and um, help them on their journey to recovery. Um, and that's about it for me as far as my personal introduction. And at this time, I'd like to present my uh, co-presenter, Karen Bates. Thank you, Regina. Great. All right, well, obviously, one of the things about me that you'll notice right away is that I like to be colorful, and I like to pop out. I am not a back seat. I don't like to take the back seat. I like to be right up front, and this is perfect for me. This is just wonderful. I'm so happy to see each and every one of you. Good to see you, and hope we can work together in the future. I am um, a mental health client with behavioral health at the county level. My clinic is in Ventura, across from Ventura College. And um, um, my diagnosis has been by the bipolar disorder, which means I have extreme highs and extreme lows, and those are radically and extreme and painful, both sides. So in between is where I want to stay. Anyway, uh, the other thing that I want you to know about me is I like to sing. And I have sung with the Master Chorale of Ventura County, which is now called Pacific Shores, and also am in the choir at the church that I go to. So those are very, those are very helpful for my wellness. That really is uh, nourishing for me. Also, uh, speaking of nourishing, I've, uh, my daughter introduced me to juicing vegetables and fruits, seeds and nuts, and all of the good things that we have that grow. And so I've been working with juice, fresh juices, and I think that has helped my wellness and help my brain to be healthy. So those are some things that I do and I believe in. In order for us to proceed, because we could all talk for hours about what we've done and how we feel, and I would like to hear from every one of you if I had time. I'm sure we all have a lot of things that we could discuss about our journey through life. But for today, we're having a presentation, and we want to show you a video. It will have five sections. The first section will be about the dark days, when things started to go wrong. What was the very worst of it all? What was the worst and dark, darkest day? Um, then we talk about what, how we managed to come to the idea that we needed help. How did we accept that we needed help? The third portion will be what the treatment was for, that, for those services that we asked for. And the next portion will be what are our coping skills, our personal coping skills. Then we'll be talking about our successes. And then we'll be talking about our hopes and dreams. So there are five portions to our video. And so I'll go ahead and ask Kimo to roll them. Dark days tend to be primarily the depression, 
as it is with many people with the, the diagnosis of bipolar disorder. My diagnosis is uh, schizophrenia with panic disorder and um, OCD. I got my diagnosis in 1999 with major depression with psychotic features. My diagnosis is borderline personality disorder and basically for me that means that I have severe mood swings, extreme mood swings. My diagnosis is panic disorder with agoraphobia and substance abuse. Oh, I have bipolar disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder. I've been diagnosed with uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, bipolar disorder, and general anxiety disorder. When I got the diagnosis of bipolar disorder. Initially, I was diagnosed um, in my 30s, I believe it was, with um, clinical depression and anxiety. When I was 18 and went into treatment for drugs and alcohol and started getting sober, I started having a lot of anxiety, um, panic attacks, to where if I was driving somewhere, I would start getting dizzy spells. Um, my heart rate would go really fast. I would feel um, just afraid all of a sudden. I would park in a parking lot, telling my wife I, would go, I was going to work and then call in sick and wait till she left home and went to work and then go back home and go to sleep. So I think that was the point where I really knew something was wrong. It just made me want to crawl into bed, crawl under my bed. It's a place I used to spend a lot of time, it was either under my bed or in the closet. Um, Some place where I couldn't feel, think, hear, see, and be totally deprived of any kind of stimuli because just being out in the world was too intense. I'm a Korean American adoptee, and when my adoptive mom called me from home to tell me that my birth mother had contacted me by a translated letter, that's when I went to my first full-blown manic episode. In the morning, I would start out high as a kite, and then by evening, I would be suicidal. I was self-injuring, going from job to job, um, wasting a lot of time just wandering around doing nothing in a daze. I eventually thought everybody was right. You know, I am a joke, I'm a failure, I'm a loser. What, what's the point of trying anymore? So I tried to end it by overdosing on the medication I was given to treat my disorder. That was probably one of, one of my darkest days. I felt worthless. I felt as though I was like an alien in the world that didn't belong. I always thought that I sh should be, the world would be better off if I was dead. They thought that I was possessed by demons or that the house was haunted because I used to see people and I used to hear voices. So they used to have the priest come down and bless the home and they tried to do the um, exorcist on me so I can, you know, get those demons out. Initially, when I went to the VA in July of 1993 and asked for help and, and told them uh, what my concerns were, they told me that the earliest appointment I could get would be January 1994. By the time I got that appointment, I had lost my job. Um, Child Protective Services came and took my door away, and uh, I wound up homeless. I would rather have broken bones. I'd rather have kidney stones that I have to pass. I'd rather deliver 15-pound twins, you know, with no anesthesia, than have a bad bout of depression. <laughs> Well, as a person <clears throat> diagnosed with bipolar and um, PTSD, I can relate to many of um, the stories that uh, you re recently saw there. Um, I experienced many dark days from the age of 44 to 40. And those days were filled with many types of abuse. But my darkest days began when my father passed away. It was a huge trigger for me because he was my best friend. And um, as you may uh, know, sometimes a traumatic experience can bring about um, the manifestation of mental health illness symptoms. So for me, that was um, the beginning of my journey, actually. 
And I remember going to my pastor and explaining to him that I was very depressed. My dad and I would go to the same church on Sundays, and then we'd always go out to eat afterwards. And I just couldn't bring myself to go to church without him. And so I went to my pastor and I said, I just can't shake this depression. And he said, well, you know, maybe you just need to serve more. Maybe you need to pray more. Maybe you need to read your Bible more. And I said, okay. So I tried that, and it didn't work. And so I went back, and I was very active in my church. I taught Sunday school, led a woman's Bible study, was an usher. And, uh, but I just was so numb. I had no motivation or desire to do anything. And so I went back and um, still didn't get any help. And that was like, just real, if anything, it just driven, drove me deeper into my depression because I just felt so alienated from people that I thought could help me and that would understand what I was going through. And so I just spiraled deeper into my depression. And um, I just, I sunk deeper, and at that time, I began experiencing um, symptoms that I could have been the perfect poster person for bipolar. Um, experiencing many symptoms that go along with that disorder. And then, about, I was 40 years old, and I experienced my first psychotic break. Um, I had a lot of suicide um, ideations, a lot of self-harm. Um, I eventually um, needed to be um, admitted to the San Francisco um, University. It's a teaching hospital for um, psychiatrists. And that's when I received my diagnosis and began to move forward. And I, Karen, my, would you like to share? Mm -hmm. so Jan. Okay, let me review my notes really quickly. I left them here. We're going to be talking about the dark days. Okay. I'll keep this handy. I'll go down my list. <laughs> First of all, when I was about 17 years old, I started having very, very radical mood swings, and I thought it was due to growing up. I thought when I was feeling powerful and energized that this was part of establishing my independence from my parents but I went way over the top in doing that and didn't realize that I had a treatable condition. For many, many years, I continued to have this overprojection of energy and very, very uh, strong ideas about doing missions. I always had a lot of missions that I wanted to perform. I wanted everyone to win. I would call the racetrack and ask them if they could make a day when everybody wins. I had all these ideas about how I could make the world a more comfortable place. And they were all over the top. And nobody could understand what in the world I was going to do with these ideas. They didn't want to follow me in that pursuit. They were way over the top. So as uh, time progressed, and I, then I would continue along my way, and one day I would wake up and everything would be black, just dark like the lights were on, shining really bright, maybe 100,000 watts for my energetic period, and then, boom, no light at all. I couldn't think of a reason to get up. I couldn't think of any reason to live. I couldn't think of anything good that ever happened. I couldn't think of any, uh, anything except that I should probably not burden the world with myself anymore and I should get rid of myself. Fortunately, I couldn't think of a way to do that that wasn't messy or that might cause trauma for my family, so it never happened. But that's the kind of thinking that goes on in the mind of a person who has that deep, dark, manic depressive depression. And like the lady said, there's nothing worse. So along the way, I um, ended up having, I'll, I'll take you to my marriage. I was married at the age of 20, 19, 1920. 
And I um, subsequently had three children. All the time I was manic depressive. I was shooting high energy and zero energy cycles continually. And the high energy was the most prominent part of my experience. The depressions were horrifying and I struggled and scratched to get out of those dark holes. The high energy appealed to me and at one point in my life I had three children under the age of five. I was conducting a daycare center, a food co-op, this was out of my home, <coughs> and I would go down to the school and copy the weekly community paper. And so I was really busy. I was on the phone all the time. And if in, wherever I went, I had a stroller with three kids hanging on it. It was, it was a sight, I'm sure. And so I was busy on the phone, organizing all these various activities and thinking I was doing wonderfully. My husband talked to my parents, and, who lived a, far, a distance away, and said, I need help. Your daughter's acting out. I can't understand what she needs. I don't know what to do with her. She's always busy. She never sleeps. She doesn't eat properly. She doesn't. Well, I'm afraid the children are, are not getting the best of care. I have to go to work. I don't know what to do. And I had no clue that there was anything upsetting about my behavior. To me, it seemed perfectly normal, and I was thrilled to be able to do as much as I was doing. My parents came from a distant city. And they visited for a while and said we were going to go to Salinas, which was close to where we were living at the time. And we were going to go shopping and go to our favorite restaurant for pie and, and a dinner. So in the car we all got, and we didn't go to that restaurant and we didn't go to that shopping center. We went to see a psychiatrist named Raymond Hack. And that was really appalling to me. The, the psychiatrist, Raymond, said after about two minutes, sitting down with me, he said, she's manic, she needs to be hospitalized immediately. Now, no one had explained to me what that was or that I might have a condition of any kind that was treatable. I just assumed that nobody liked me and that they didn't appreciate all the things that I was doing and that they couldn't comprehend why I was doing so much. So I ended up in a hospital for at least two weeks, put on medications, and I was very, very sad. I felt completely abandoned, under misunderstood, and rejected. That was the worst day of my life when I was put in a hospital against my will without any understanding of what was going on inside my brain. Now we have to have the video. I think the key for my acceptance was to realize that as a person with a mental illness, that I'm a person first. And I know it sounds kind of cheesy or cliche to some people, but really it's the truth. I think what finally led me to the point where I could accept it was the support of friends and family. For them to say, Heather, you have a problem, but we love you anyway. That made it okay for me to say the same thing to myself. I really didn't have a clear understanding of what I had until I was actually a resident in psychiatry. And I was working in an ER and had a severe episode at that time. And suddenly I had a patient who had the same symptoms I did. And I realized that I couldn't really deny this. I, I could see what the other patient, the patient, well, the other patient had. Uh, and then it was very obvious that I had the same thing. Now that I got this diagnosis, I could do something about it, just like I did something about the drug addiction. So acceptance just came right immediately. It's like, yes, that's that. I can do this now. Another thing that helped me with my acceptance was to learn about famous people with mental illness. Um, that gave me a lot of hope. You know, Michelangelo, Vincent Van Gogh, Georgia O'Keeffe, Charles Schultz, Abraham Lincoln. It's not my fault. It's not my parents' fault. You know, it, it's, um, it's an illness that many people deal with and that I'm not alone. I don't have to deal with it alone. And that I can go out and, and <coughs> try to tell my story to help other people. And so um, that, was, that was the turning point for me. NAMI has helped me by understanding, educating, and also not only me, but my family. If it wasn't the fact that my family has been educated on this and I didn't have the support of my family, I think it would have taken twice as long for me to be in recovery.
So after therapy, I realized that I had suffered from bipolar at an early age, and my first experience with, um, with treatment was in 1966. I was in second grade, and it was after a traumatic experience and all they had available to me was to play with the dollhouse. We've come so far. Um, my next experience came in 1973, my freshman year of high school. I lost completely, um, complete touch with reality. And I was taken into an inpatient stay. And to their surprise, there was no drugs in my system. My treatment was horrific and I was subject to unethical behaviors from professionals and more trauma. During my childbearing years, um, I suffered from severe postpartum depression, and the next 18 years were an emotional roller coaster. But by the grace of God, I was able to raise my three daughters, and they were what gave me um, the strength to, to go on. Um, and uh, my acceptance of having mental illness hasn't really been an issue for me. It, the issue has been more of the infliction of rejection that came from the ripples of having mental illness. My true acceptance came when I accepted God's forgiveness and I surrendered my guilt and shame, thus having self forgiveness, but also having a husband that was con loved me conditionally and held my hope for me was tremendous. Having NAMI available um, to us was um, really a big part of m our, my acceptance because my husband was so into finding out what was wrong with me. When I was released from the hospital, the mental health court judge said, I'm happy to release her into your care, but you have to take a 30-day leave of absence and make sure that she gets the care that she needs in your area. So we both went to different psychologists and psychiatrists. I tried, I was my human guinea pig. Um, for about a year and a half before I could find the right, medic right cocktail that worked for me. And my husband w went to the library. He's not techno savvy, so he didn't know how to go online or anything like that. But he, um, we reached out to NAMI and we took the family to family and it just provided an, um, an immense amount of support to him and strengthened him so that he could um, deal with all of the adjustments that came our way. So that's um, how I came to accept that um, my, yes, I have bipolar, I have, but it does not define me, and um, that's why I'm here today. Karen. Thanks, Regina. Oh boy. Well, I'll pick up where I left off. I was in a hospital for a couple of weeks, maybe three, three weeks. And during that time, I was put on medications. When I left the hospital, I threw away the medications because I never believed I needed them. I never believed there was anything wrong with me. And even though I met a lot of interesting characters in the hospital, I felt that we were all simply rejected, misunderstood, and uh, underrated people. So I went out with gusto, and at that point, my ex-husband said, I can't stay with you anymore. I don't trust you with the children. You're not taking your medication. I don't know what's wrong with you. I can't have you uh, anymore in my life. I need to uh, set you, you have to go. And uh, so the next worst day of my life was the day I left the house. And that was the end of me seeing the children. Because remember, if you are not doing well and you are becoming a, a nuisance and maybe unpredictable and maybe that makes people nervous, think how my family felt about me when I was acting out and when I was over the top with everything that I did and said. So I had to leave. They were, it was unhealthy. And I didn't realize that it was my doing. I didn't realize that, that it was just that they didn't like me anymore. That's how I felt. Well, they just don't like me. They don't get me. I have to go. 
So I took my sewing machine, sold it for $200, and spent like four years out in the world with no resources. My, my family did not want me to communicate with them. And uh, I ended up homeless. Of course, I ended up getting in trouble with the um, law enforcement. I was stealing uh, food, cigarettes, and coffee. I was um, helping uh, people to get by on the streets. We were all out there, a lot of folks uh, during those days, and we tried to help each other, which was a good experience, but a lot of times we'd end up in trouble because there was stealing and there was rapes, there was over overdoses, there was a lot of things that went on in the mix. So all these years, now I'm away from my family. I'm starting this life of complete freedom and complete abandon. I had no resources. I didn't have anyone in my life or would I let anyone in my life that didn't agree with everything I wanted, that didn't understand that I had a gift, that I was spiritually energized, that I had a mission. And I thought, you know, just like uh, perhaps a priest or a nun would be, I had to stand alone and I had to fight, fight the world and try to do good. And um, it just got me in lots of trouble because nobody could follow me. And I didn't, I didn't understand what people were trying to tell me. People who loved me tried to tell me that I needed help. And I thought they were just really slow and didn't get it. So the way that happened, about when I was about 50 years old, I was in a hotel room that the county had put me up in. And remember, I'm going to hospitals and jails constantly. That was the only roof over my head for years. And so I ended up in this motel because I was homeless and the county put me in a hotel for a night so I could rest. While I was asleep, someone broke in and took everything I had, which was no surprise because I lost everything I had over and over again. There was no way to hold on to it. I didn't have an address. I didn't have anyone to leave it with. And there was people out there that were desperate. So I constantly, and there again, there goes everything. I had just finally gotten SSI and there goes all my money. There goes everything. So I said to myself, you know, this is kind of a repeat story. I've, I've gone through this a number of times where I've lost everything and I'm kind of sick of it. And I'm getting old and I'm tired. I am tired. And I decided to ask for help at that point. I asked for an appointment with a psychiatrist. I asked for an appointment with a social worker. And I asked for an appointment with a psychologist because I wanted someone to talk to, someone to help me straighten out my thoughts. And I got all three. I was lucky. I had SSI at that time, so I had Medi-Cal. And I was able to get those three people in my life. And that was uh, a big help. So that's the acceptance. I had to come to that place where there was really, I had gotten to my last nerve cell and I asked for help, and that's how acceptance took place, and from there on, it was a complete turning point, and everything started to fall together, and we'll talk about that later. Being an active partner in my treatment, I think is very important. I used to kind of be very passive and just go to the doctor, and whatever they said, you know, I would um, just keep my mouth shut, but now I read everything I can get my hands on, and I go into the doctor and I say, I read this, what do you think about this? Uh, what basically my treatment consists of um, me seeing my therapist, me seeing my psychiatrist, me taking my meds. That is a 100% met, must. I learned the hard way that I cannot stop taking them. In the 14 years since I've been in treatment, uh, I haven't had a, a medication that I've taken yet to get <laughs> side effects. Um, there, it just goes to the territory as far as I'm concerned. Even though there are a lot of side effects, I think that it's very important that one takes the medication. But one thing, I'd rather be a little husky and chubby and um, have a, a wonderful husband and have a wonderful life than to be skinny and in the hospital. I had to trust my doctor before I could really let my treatment fully begin because these are psychotropic medications affecting one of the most important organs in your body. So it was really important, I think, for me to be able to find that doctor that I could trust. Therapy helped me work through a lot of issues that were going on in my life, but it also helped me in dealing with stress and doing relaxation techniques and things like that to reduce my anxiety. That was a big part of my treatment. Well, as um, they've shared, um, treatment can be, uh, boy, 
a difficult process. Um, when I came back from San Francisco and I started to find um, the right resources to help me on a professional level, um, I was really fortunate to find a psychiatrist who took me under her wing. So most of the, the, most of the time your psychiatrist basically just does your medication and manages that and doesn't do the therapy part of it. But I was fortunate enough, this um, doctor, she, um, Dr. Azad, I'll never forget her because she's, she was just such an integral part of, um, of my recovery. She took me under my wing and also did my therapy as well. So I was very fortunate. And um, she uh, worked with me and uh, there were still days in that process of finding the right medication that um, I was still suicidal. I could relate to the one speaker about being in the closet. Um, I would be so depressed that I would go into a walk-in closet and just sit in a fetal possession, position and just rock back and forth. It just, I just isolated myself. And um, I went through the feelings of guilt and shame and the pain. For me, the, the pain was like having um, those old school ball and chains, you know, from those movies where you see them, you know, they're walking around with those big ball and chains. For me, that's what it was like, actually physically feeling that, and then just being in, tossed into quicksand and being pulled out and then being pulled but pushed back in. It was just this vicious circle. And so um, I was admitted to Vista Del Mar in Ventura. I was fortunate to have good insurance. And um, they told my husband that if I didn't um, agree to take this six-week outpatient, intensive outpatient treatment program, that I would have to go to a facility. Um, and so um, I said, okay, I'll do this. So for six weeks, every day, a bus, I felt like a little kid, a bus would come pick me up and take me to Vista Del Mar, and, they'd, um, and I did that every day for six weeks, and it really, really began to turn my life around. Um, during that six weeks, though, it was like these light bulbs went off. It was like, you know, it's like an onion. You're just peeling layers. Oh, that's why I did that when I was seven. That's why I responded that way when I was nine. That's why I did what I did when I was 12. It was just like all these light bulbs went off because I had just kind of stuffed that and suppressed it. And, you know, that, that's the misconception about mental illness because people think that because you're living a normal life, you're okay. But I went, like I said, I didn't start my recovery till I was 40 and had already raised three children, was involved in their school, was a soccer co mom and, you know, did PTA and, you know, and then I would just cringe at night and just rock myself to sleep and, and cry because I was in so much pain. And nobody could even explain to me that it actually you feel physical pain with this illness. Um, so I went from not being suicidal anymore and not having suicide ideation to self-harm. So because as I was peeling those layers off of uh, that onion, it was very painful. And um, one day um, I had injured myself so badly that I looked in the mirror and I said, I can't do this anymore. I said, I, there's either something has got to give. And that's when I said, I put, pulled, put my big girl panties on and pulled them up and I said, okay, I'm tired of feeling this. And I just put myself into my treatment and gave it wholeheartedly. Again, my husband was my, continued to hold my hope. Um, and that's when my life really began to turn around. Mm -hmm. And um, just, this is my, actually, I have a confession to make. This is my very first In Our Own Voice presentation. And my dear friend Karen has done so many of these. <laughs> so I'm going to lean on her for um, direction. 
-hmm. because I believe at this time we're supposed to ask the audience questions. Yes, this is a good middle uh, like point. Like a break before, time. Before I talk about that subject, maybe we could just see if anyone has questions or comments. And we'll do this again at the end. So if you're just contemplating and you're not ready to ask or comment, but if you have anything that's burning in your heart to ask or to say, uh, raise your hand. If we have any questions for our speakers, I can come and bring Stand up for mm -hmm. me. Yeah. So Sure, if anyone does. If not at this point, then we'll, we'll, we'll check it out at the end. Anybody have a question or a comment yet? Okay, well, we'll continue our story then. That's fine. Thank you. That's fine. We're talking about treatment. And Regina, I'm still talking about treatment, so because okay. you had talked about yours. And I wanted to uh, explain a little bit about mine. I think, much like Regina, the treatment was helpful, but there were parts of it that didn't work. Sometimes the medications that I was prescribed would make me sleepy, or um, certainly gained a lot of weight on some of them, and uh, sometimes they made me feel suicidal, and sometimes they made me feel too jittery, and sometimes um, Sometimes they made me feel like I had a thick tongue and a dry mouth, and it was just uncomfortable. So I was very upset until I found a, a, a medication formula that worked for me, and that took years. So uh, nowadays the medications are a little bit more sophisticated, and they don't have as many side effects, so that's good. But in my day, they were really tough and um, hard on the body. But we got through it. I was able to partner with my doctor and my social worker and my psychiatrist. I actually fired two psychiatrists and got one that would agree to help me try a medication that would not normally be used in my condition. And it worked very well, partly because I believed it would and partly because it was what I needed to help the depression, which was my very most horrible experience. Are you raising your hand? I am. Yes. Uh, may I ask what medication? Um, we are not able to discuss that okay. only because, and I would love to tell you on the side, but I can't discuss it because everybody has a different chemistry, and I wouldn't want you to think that that would help you necessarily as it did me. Yeah. So I just can't be like advertising what worked for me, but I, I will tell you on the side if you want to know. But yeah, I know because medication is a huge labyrinth, and I've been through it, and I could talk a little bit about what works for me. So anyway, that was good. I partnered with, I also had a psychologist who told me uh, that I needed to work on my self-esteem and I needed to set boundaries. And I was like, what? <laughs> so we had to start from scratch and talk about cognitive behavioral therapy. That was really helpful to me, to help me set boundaries, to help me look at the way I was thinking, to help me determine if something would really work uh, one way or another. Would something really, would really be so terrible if I tried it, you know? I always had a mindset. I wouldn't do certain things. And I tried to open up to that after talking with my psychologist and getting some good basics on how to think and how to really assess things and make a better choice. So that was wonderful help. And then my social worker, Lord knows I needed everything. I had to get SSI, which I had to apply for twice. I was rejected the first time. And I needed a roof over my head. I needed uh, you know, insurance, uh, transportation, all kinds of things. So that social worker was a really great person, helped me get everything in place, helped me fill out the forms, and um, provided me eventually with an address, which was a big help. Let me tell you, if, you haven't, if you've never been homeless or not had an address or a phone number, it is almost impossible to get a job or to, you know, to, to keep in touch with anybody or to keep your stuff together. It's almost impossible. So uh, I feel for the people, there are like 10,000 people in our county that are homeless right now, and I really feel how, how difficult it is. It was difficult enough when I was going through it, but now it's more people. So we need a lot more things. But anyway, I got those things from social services, from my social worker. So I had this wonderful team I worked with, and I wish everybody that needs help with their emotional health or their addiction challenges, you know, would be able to get those three things in their life. It's a big help. And so that treatment was good. I also, my psychologist also um, inspired me to find something to do in the community where I could start to give back. 
So part of my treatment was uh, not only get a roof over my head and get some resources, but to, um, to do something in the community, because I've always been on a mission. So I was able to attend a mental health board meeting and liked it, and they needed clients on the mental health board that is now called the Behavioral Health Advisory Board because we've combined mental health with addiction challenges. So uh, we have a lot of, of dual, uh, a lot of dual situations. So uh, now we have the Behavioral Health Advisory Board and I've been on that off and on for many, many years. And that's been a great way for me to look at programs and maybe create some new ones, help to create new ones and build new, uh, new edifices and look at the wellness aspect of mental health and not just the medications. So um, the treatment just went on and on, and uh, I had to put a lot of it into it. I had to put a lot into it myself. I had to make some healthy choices in order to stay well, along with the supports I got from my team of three people. So that's the treatment. Okay, so coping skills. Um, when I was in that six weeks intensive uh, day treatment, um, I did learn a lot of coping skills and things that I could do to, um, to help me. Um, I've always enjoyed um, the outdoors, um, especially the ocean. I love to swim. Um, I love to take walks on the beach. And, um, you know, they would throw a lot of things out. you like, well, journaling or um, different things. And I don't have a creative bone in my body. So it was like, no, that's just too, um, too much creativity for me. It was really hard for me to put my thoughts and feelings and, into a notebook. But I know a lot of people where that's been a really great form of coping skills for them. But for me, it's kind of getting out of my surroundings. So getting out of those four walls and getting outside and getting some fresh air and um, riding my bike um, also helped. But um, like Karen said, you know, giving back to the community. So um, I had not gone back to work. Um, my psychiatrist did not release me to go back to work. Um, and so I decided that maybe I would do some volunteer work. And <clears throat> I remember I, my background, I had been a um, school secretary for 10 years um, and then bounced back and forth from jobs just because there was this um, discontentment and I was always looking for something to make me feel better and I thought, well, if I change jobs. 
So my background was always in um, administration. So I was an administrative assistant, I was an executive assistant, I was a human resources manager, but nothing, none of that made me happy. But I felt like, gosh, I'm missing such a big part of my life and the things I used to, to do. What can I do to cope with not having anywhere to, to go and you know, no eight to five schedule? So I decided to volunteer in my church office and they gave me this collate, collating project. And I thought, shoot, you know, this, this is really easy. I could do this, right? Well, I don't know. I think the machine was headed in for me the, when I first walked in because the copies got all messed up, and I just got so confused. I couldn't put anything together, and I just had a meltdown. I went into the bathroom, and I cried, and I thought, okay, I'm not ready for this. So um, I gave it a little bit more time. Um, I started gardening. Um, at the time, we had a great backyard, and I loved doing that. Um, so that became a coping skill. Again, it was something outdoors, and um, I loved raising my vegetables, eating my fresh cucumbers and tomatoes and carrots and things like that. So that was a great coping skill. But I still felt like there was something missing. Um, I just still felt like, okay, I got, there's got to be more to this. Plus, you know, when you go from having an income you know, had be a person that was uh, a wife that was bringing in a big chunk of money to just going on disability. Um, I felt like, well, maybe I need to start thinking about going back to work. Well, I wasn't quite ready. So, anyways, I had attended um, a NAMI function um, with my husband. I believe it was the family to family, and they were looking for volunteers um, in the office. So. Um, I started out um, going into the office and helping um, with various office things, and then I was given a program to coordinate, and um, it was really great. But I don't know, I just still felt like there was a sense, I was still missing something. I still had this void, and I remembered having that same void when my dad passed away. It was like just this hole. And my oldest daughter um, became pregnant, and um, it was a very difficult, she was in a very difficult traumatic um, relationship. And so she moved back home um, early on in her pregnancy. And um, I was still working on my recovery. And uh, anyways, when it got close to my grandson being born, uh, my daughter wanted to go back to work. She um, uh, wanted to go on and get her master's and I kept thinking well how can I help and so um, the day that I held Josiah Michael in my arms it was like this amazing sense of hope just I can't even begin to tell you the only way I can maybe explain to you is like the happiest day you have ever had one day that you were just so happy and it was like I just felt this intense happiness and this intense joy that I'd never felt before. And I knew that that was my purpose at the time. And that was, my, um, that was what was going to give me that joy and that happiness that I didn't have for such a long time. So I became his caregiver. My daughter went back to work um, after, ten, after he was 10 weeks old. And I took care of him while she worked. And I took care of her while she went back to school to get her master's. And so that life gave me life again. Because even though I had a loving husband and I had loving friends and family, I still felt a void and I still felt numb. So his little life somehow gave me life. And so he for, um, he's now 13. Um, I said I wasn't going to do this, but my daughter and grandson relocated to Chicago in July of this year. And um, that's been really difficult for me because um, he was in my life every single day. Um, so I'm having to learn new coping skills for the first time in a lot of years. So I'm searching for what's next <laughs> for me in my next season of life. And my husband and I are adjusting to being empty nesters because we've been married 38 years. But out of those 
38, 36 of those years, we've always had children with us for one reason or another, raising them. They went off to college, came home from college, and so forth. So now we're empty nesters. So I'm learning new coping skills. Thank you. Karen. She's not a bad presenter. I think we'll keep her. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, I'm going to have to be brief because our time will run out. Does anyone know how much time we have left? For this? Okay, so, but I will try to be brief because my coping skills are uh, the two main ones. <laughs> um, on a scale of one to ten, I used to be a minus three or a 13. Not good, not healthy, not helpful. <laughs> so I want to keep it at a seven. And I do my best to keep my, my mental state, my emotional levels, and my, my physical health right around a seven. Of course, it wavers a little bit, but when it starts to go out of balance, that's when my coping skills come into play, which are if I'm starting to get depressed, I want to start enlivening my life with some really great, I love classical music or a good brisk walk. All of the things that you've probably tried yourself work very well. And then when I'm starting to get a little bit too much energy and I can't sleep, it's chamomile tea, hot showers, and all those things that'll simmer things down, shutting down all the lights, all of the stimuli and just relaxing and getting in touch with the inner self, with the inner core, which I never used to do. So that's a really good thing. A coping skill is to relax. Relaxing is not easy for a person who has a tendency to be manic, so it requires a warrior strength to calm down. And I have tried to do that. Also, I wrote an, um, an advanced directive to my parents and I said, if you notice my behavior getting out of hand, that's the manic side, the one that makes them so uncomfortable and me so happy. <laughs> uh, I said, if you start to notice me slipping, please tell me and I will listen and I will do whatever it takes to get well, to get back on track. And since I wrote that and handed it out to my parents, my children and my doctors, it has not been necessary. Isn't that amazing? I'm so glad about that. It was magic. <laughs> I said I'd, I'd listen and I didn't have to. <laughs> I love it. Uh, so far, so far. I shouldn't crow. I shouldn't crow because it could happen tomorrow. <laughs> Be careful. So anyway, um, but those are my coping skills. And um, you know that I believe in the healing power of people sharing their stories. And that has been so healing for me to be able to talk a little bit about what has, going, uh, has gone on with me. And then if I had time, I would listen to every single one of you because it teaches me so much to hear how you've handled what happened for you. So I'm just um, coping. And you know, like Regina says, it keeps changing. Your life situation will keep changing and you'll be thrown new curves. So your coping skills have to be finessed and adjusted constantly. It's an ongoing process. The film. I define success for myself as enjoying my day-to-day -day life, enjoying my relationships with people I care about, and feeling as if I have a purpose in life. So my goals have to do with my home-based business. I like to see it grow to the point where um, I can eventually get off of disability. I lived in this, this trailer that was, I call it my dingy middle trailer. But that was really the best home I ever had because it was mine. I paid to live there by myself. I lived there by myself and I could take care of myself. And I never knew that I could do that. I'm just so happy that I'm gonna be able to actually um, complete my um, PhD. But it'll always be that bachelor's degree. It'll always be that bachelor's degree that's my biggest success. I went to Elmhurst College and finished my degree in psychology. Um, that was a big achievement for me because I never thought that after my illness that I could accomplish anything again. I just got a, a scholarship to Cal Berkeley to a summer program. Um, so I hope to transfer to Cal Berkeley in psychology. And, um, you know, it seems like a dream, but I, I think it's attainable if I keep working hard. And um, yeah, a lot of great stuff's happening. So. I have a great job. I would not get my job up for anything in the world. Um, I'm 
I help people to help themselves so they can help other people in this, this tremendous illness. And educating people, I think it's one of the things that I can call a success, that I am out there helping educate people and eliminate the stigma on mental health. I never in my life thought I would have got married. I never in my life thought I would have had anybody to love me enough to marry me. And when I met her, just, man, she was so awesome. I mean, she accepted me, and she fell in love with me, and I fell in love with her, so that was, that's another part of my success, too. I mean, she's my greatest success of all, besides getting up this morning. <laughs> Success, hopes, and dreams completely shattered at one point in my life. But going through what we've talked about today, my successes. So I went to a NAMI conference, state conference, and they had this workshop for peers. And I thought, hmm. Topic looks interesting. I'll check it out. So it was a big room. I sat in the very back. And this room was completely filled with people that had mental health challenges. But they'd gotten a place in their lives where they were high functioning, which is not a, not, which is not a recovery language word. But um, just to give you an idea, they were high functioning. They were back to work. They were professionals. They were sisters, brothers, mothers, fathers, cousins. The, the room was diverse from, you know, college age students all the way to young seniors like myself. Um, and they were talking about um, peer support. And it was the first time that I'd ever heard that in my journey. I'd never heard that. And I'm sitting in the back of the room, and they're having these panels of discussions and so forth, and I just start bawling. And the lady next to me says, are you OK? And I said, I have never heard any of this before in my life. And um, she said, talked with me for a little bit. The panel came over and talked with me a little bit. They invited me to have um, dinner with them that night. And it, again, I thought I was done peeling that onion, but there was still layers. So that was like, wow. So I decided to, at that point, step out of the role as a family member and a NAMI advocate and doing all of that into the peer support movement. So I after two and a half years of serving as an administrative volunteer for NAMI, I decided to resign from that position. And within a week, I was interviewed at the Client Network, um, which is, um, we are a grassroots advocacy group. We do a lot of education, resources, one-on-one -on -one peer support. Um, we sit on a lot of the committees in the county and we do so much more. And you can ask Karen and I about that um, later. So they said, you know, we need an admin assistant. And um, I said, OK. And hey, it comes with a paycheck. <laughs> so um, one of my colleagues, um, Liz Warren, and I will eternally thank her, she says, but we have a prerequisite. We want you to go to the Recovery Innovations WELL, which stands for, which is RAP, Wellness Recovery Action Plan class, which is eight weeks. And we want you to take the peer employment training, which was a college level, 72 hour course. And I'm like, I barely made it through high school and you want me to take a college level course? But it was the best thing that I could do because like I said, it had opened up a new door for me, and through those um, trainings, I was able to become a peer support specialist. 
and I'm looking forward to becoming a certified peer support specialist um, when that comes, that certification comes to the state of California in 2017. I've taken a lot of college level courses that I never thought I could pass um, that has um, allowed me to be able to help the people that I that I help on a daily basis as a peer support specialist. So that is my huge success, is that um, I came full circle and have been able to be successful again. Um, my hopes, my hope is that I continue to realize that my recovery is something that I have to practice every day. That every, all of my coping skills, um, getting things out of my toolbox when I'm going through a difficult time, that I will, this, doesn't, this illness does not define me, but it requires treatment. As someone said about our brain, our brain is an organ just like our heart and our liver and our kidneys and so forth. So my, my hope is that I can rem always remember that um, Every day is a new day, and that my recovery um, is an everyday process, an everyday journey, and I'll, it's changed in many ways, but I'm hopeful. I am hopeful because I went from those ball and chains climbing out of quicksand when they ha I had complete hopelessness. I am a... Um, 50, let's see, 15 year suicide attempt survivor. So my daily hope is I will never go back to those days again, but that I will continue to reach out to people and let them know that hope is possible because I went from having complete hopelessness to being hopeful. And so that's my hope. My dreams, my dreams would be that Maybe there will be a day that I will be completely well enough to get off of disability and maybe have a full-time job. I do have a full-time job because I work part-time for the client network, but I do a lot of advocacy. Um, but my dream would be that, um, that God would continue to use me in sharing the message of hope um, and that I could make a difference in the world by sharing my story and by letting people know that our lives are precious. Thank you. Yes, I know. I know. Mm -hmm. hmm. Well, how can I top that? <laughs> I can't. I can tell you this. Um, in all the work that I've done since I became um, interested in helping out in the community, in this chapter of my life, since I started getting treatment, since I started using my coping skills, taking a class, I got to tell you, I went to uh, Oxnard College for 10 years and got an AS. I went to Ventura College for 15 years and I got an AA, I got two AAs and I graduated in the first class that was certified with human services uh, certification. So that was really special. They, they, find, they organized it and I helped to create the certificate program and then I graduated from it. So that was really nice in 2008. But I have been in school for so many years. I feel like a PhD sometimes as far as how to get up, how to get to class, how to get that homework done and all that stuff. So I'm really with you 100%. I understand what you're going through and I understand how important it is. So keep up the good work. Even when I was hospitalized or put in jail or when I was completely disassociated from anything that was healthy for me. I still went to school. I still made it to those classes. I still got through. I met some wonderful mentors. I met some wonderful friends, lifelong friends. And everything I learned has been helpful in my journey. I have been on the on Behavioral Health Advisory Board for a long time, the Client Network for a long time. And right now, I think my, one of my biggest uh, and happiest um, 
practices is to get up and talk to the folks at the inpatient unit, the crisis residential stabilization unit, and the um, various residential facilities we have out on Lewis Road in Camarillo, where we have clients who are struggling, who are still you know, in need of the right formula for medication, who are still in need of support and someone who trusts them and who listens to them. So I'm still able to do that, to go out and visit and listen to what's going on and to offer resources, to tell them what's going on, what kind of programs we have, and what kind of classes they can take. So we have a lot of things going on at the county that I share with others. I don't have time to go into it right now, but I just want you to know that my dreams are being fulfilled. I can go into the inpatient unit and talk to the clients there. And that's where I was off and on for 30 years. So it's just such a wonderful recycling of energy and it just gives me so much pleasure. Um, and also one of my favorite dreams is to create a, like about 30 properties in this county for people that are homeless and struggling with poverty. Um, I want to see like a situation where we would have um, a living spaces, a community kitchen, a community garden, some livestock, some maybe uh, you know some mechanical work, different things that we could do and actually create products that we could actually sell, maybe a few things that we could actually bring money in to help support ourselves. I would like to see that kind of thing happen and I've been looking into it, so I hope you'll look into it with me. And we'll be working together through the years. And thanks so much for listening today. See if there's one more. It's something that you really have to realize is going to change your life. One thing that's really important for me in my life today is that it's like the baseball game. You know, the people that I choose in my life today, I want people who are going to make my team the best team. You know, so it helps me to pick positive people in my life. And now my mom and my brothers and sisters are a big part of my recovery. They're there for me, and my husband and my son are the most important people in my life. I will not let this illness defeat me. I will not let it beat me. And my faith tells me that, you know, with the strength of my, my God that I, I believe in, that I can do anything, and I can survive this illness. I want to show other people, look, you can have something serious, but you can live a healthy life and you can be in recovery. These stories demonstrate how some individuals with mental illness experience recovery. Recovery is not only a reality for some, but also a possibility for millions of Americans affected by one of these serious medical illnesses each year.